I, uh, I just hear me. Uh, I just want to say really quick that uh, I appreciate that we have a pianist that I can come up here at the most random times, and somehow she always finds a way to just kind of, you know, end it and finish it out. So appreciate you. <laughs> um, today uh, we have some exciting things happening. Um, next week being the Easter Sunday service. Um, if you missed it, be here at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. We're going to be doing the Easter sunrise service. It's a great time to be able to uh, come out, get some coffee, get some donuts, and, uh, you know, wake up and just start the day with God on that Easter Sunday. And uh, at 11 a.m., we'll have a worship service. So, again, come out early, get your coffee and donuts, go home, take a break for a little bit, get back out here at 11. There'll be no Sunday school that day. Um, the gathering is tonight at 6 p.m. It'll be David Noss who will be speaking, and the dinner theme will be Italian. Um, 6 p.m., come out here, come listen, come get in community, be with people, and it'll be a great time. The ladies' Bible study will be uh, covering Genesis, and it'll meet Tuesday, March 26 at 6.30. And the books are $15. I believe speak to Allison if you have any questions about that or if you want to get the books for it. Um, it's a great chance to, to get together as ladies. We will talk about the things that maybe the men don't understand as much, but uh, it's a great time. So, um, And let's see here. Oh, helpers for VBS are needed. If you are interested at all in helping with VBS uh, this summer, it's going to be July 18th, or 8th through the 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. And, guys, we need a lot of people to help out with VBS. There is a lot of kids here, and there continues to be more and more kids here, and that is amazing and that is beautiful, but we're going to need a lot of help with VBS this year. Um, especially because I believe Allison will be out during that time, likely. Um, so as many people as are able to come help, please get, come get signed up, come help out. Um, whether it's with decorating or with actually teaching, whatever it is, there's great, great opportunities to come help out with that. Um, and please see uh, Samantha Teed if you have any questions about that. Um, and with that, can I have the worship team come on up? And we're just going to take the time to just worship God here, and I'm going to go ahead and pray us in before we start. So, God, thank you so, so much for today. Thank you for um, just being the one that we can look to, the one that we can love and uh, respect God. In everything that we do today, would we just take the time to honor you first and foremost? Um, would our hearts be pure? Would we just in every way just uh, submit ourselves before you today, God, and allow you to be the one who's in charge and us to be the one that are, are kneeling before you, God? Um, would we be diligent to worship you, not just in the singing, but in the listening of the word and in, in the doing of the word, God? Thank you so much, Lord. We love you and we praise you in your mighty name. Amen. And your feet, let's get ready to worship the Lord. Before we worship him in song, I just wanted to remind you, we come and worship the Lord on Palm Sunday. We celebrate the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It's, it's a strange day because he rides into Jerusalem with cheers and shouts of Hosanna Glory to God in the highest. You know, you, you hear all this. And then that same crowd, very much of the same people on Friday is shouting, crucify him. And sometimes you look at that and you say, well, you know, Palm Sunday wasn't really a triumphal entry. But it really was. Because Jesus rode into Jerusalem to triumph over the greatest enemy. Not Rome, but sin and death. Because of that, we can worship him today. And we look forward to his next triumphal entry when Jesus comes back in the clouds. We see in Revelation 19, he comes back in the clouds to rule and reign, have a kingdom that goes on forever. So I hope today reminds you of Jesus' conquering sin and death. And I hope it causes you to look forward in hope. Look forward in hope to when Jesus comes back and you come back with him. If you're in Christ, riding on a white horse, you come back with him. What an exciting thing. What a, what a reason to celebrate as Christians. Well, let's, let's begin our celebration. Worship the Lord singing our God.
And uh, this was been in the late 19th century. There was a pastor, and his son uh, was not growing up to love the Lord. You could just see there was something willful in him. And, and so my, this pastor said to him, he said, he thought, you know, if I can get my son to go to Moody Bible Institute, and, and I can get him to go to this school, then surely they can turn things around for him. And so he met with the president of, of Moody and the president said, you know, we're not in the business of taking people who, who don't have a, a vibrant relationship with the Lord. So we're not a reform school. We, we can't take your son. And, and the pastor pleaded with the president of Moody. And he said, if you would just please take my son. I'll tell you what, if he, if he meets with you, if, if you could meet with him, if you, if you would just please take him. And the, the president said, if he meets with me once a week and he keeps that up, and as long as he meets with me and engages me in conversation, we can try this. And so when you know that pastor's son came to Moody and he, he met with the president and he did that over and over again. And by God's grace, you know, six months in, he got saved, gloriously saved. And that boy is the one who wrote this song at Calvary. And so it's, it's his testimony that we read about years. We, when you read it and sing it, years I've spent in vanity and pride, that's him. And I think that probably resonates with you as you think about the years that you spent in vanity and pride, not caring that God was crucified and and how the cross changed everything. And as we look towards next, this coming Friday, and we look towards the resurrection, I pray that this just reminds you of your own testimony. Let's sing at Calvary. <laughs> Was free. Pardon, there was blood to fly. 
our next song was inspired by Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and it is safe. So we can rest assured and feel comfort as we sing your name. As Father, we just thank you for the ways you bless our lives in so many ways and uh, just the gift of salvation. Thank you for the opportunity we have to even be a part of the ministry that you have here on earth. And I just pray that as we present these offerings that you would just multiply in whatever way you see fit and just be glorifying and honoring to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
take your Bibles and turn to two places. Turn to John chapter 18, and then keep your finger there, or slide your bulletin in there, and turn to Matthew 26. As you turn in there, I'm going to ask you a question, see if you can figure out when I'm talking about. I know a lot of you weren't alive, which is weird to think about, but where were you the morning, where were you the morning of October 5th, 1995? Lincoln, I know you weren't alive. Okay. Where were you the morning of October 5th, 1995? And uh, it was the morning when the, when the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial was, was read. And so maybe you can remember where you were, those of you who were alive during that time, because that was a really big deal. The O.J. Simpson, you remember that? You're like, and and this, this was really kind of a miscarriage of justice. I mean, um, and I remember I was, I was at LCA my senior year of high school, and they pulled us out of class, and we watched this, this verdict being handed down. Uh, there have been things that have been called, I, I think maybe that was the trial of the century, of, of the 20th century, there's lots of trials. Trials, we get sucked into trials. Um, but I'm telling you, as we move forward past Palm Sunday, and I'm really going to look at the events that take place this coming Thursday, I want to show you the trial of really the millennium. I'm going to show you the trial that was. I'm going to show you the ultimate trial, the trial of all time that's coming, the trial that's coming and then I'm going to show you a trial that's the most important trial of your life right here today. We're going to look at the, the trial of Jesus, the trial of the king, the trial that was, the trial that's coming, and the trial before you today. And we're going to look at the events of this coming Thursday night, and my goal is twofold. First of all, that everyone here would be ready to meet the king. As Paul says in Philippians 2, every knee will bow before Jesus so today's the day of salvation, if you're not sure, if you have a relationship with Jesus. But for you, my brothers and sisters, I want you to be prepared. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want you to, to look forward to the Bema seat judgment of rewards. And I want you to be moving forward with that ultimate trial in view. So let's get into it. Let's start and let's look back to the trial that was before moving into the trial to come and the trial before you today. So here we are in Matt, or, uh, John 18. There's actually four trials that took place, four trials that Jesus stood before. There, the first one is a trial before Annas. The second one is the trial before the high priest at the time, Caiaphas. The third one was before Pilate. And the fourth one was before Herod. We only have time to get into those first three today. But we're going to start out in John's gospel in John 18, and we're going to look at verse 12 and 13 and make our way through this. But I just want to frame your thinking as we read and, and have these two burning questions running through your mind. I want you to think, first of all, if you could frame them kind of in negatives and positives. So here's the first question. Be thinking, where do I see the depravity of humanity? Where do I see the depravity of, of man in his natural state? As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, dead in our trespasses and sins, or, or enemies of God, as we see in Romans 5. Where do I see the depravity of man? That's the first question. So be thinking of that as we read. And then the second question, where do I see the beauty of Jesus Christ? We see in John 1.14, it was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and, and truth. Where, what, what, what do I see about Jesus' character? And I want to kind of lay those polarities before you, the negative and the positive, and let those questions just be running through your mind as we read this. So, uh, John 18, verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Remember, he had been in the Garden of Gethsemane this Thursday night. This is after he had broken bread with his disciples, the Last Supper, and, and they had taken him away. Peter's, Peter had just cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, and this is while he's being drawn away, we see in verse 12. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. And, and Annas and Caiaphas would trade places as high priest. They kept it all in the family. It was a, it was a ceremonial term, really, and uh, a ceremonial position. Uh, it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Okay, skip on down to verse 19. 
The high priest, who we know is Caiaphas, so this is the second trial. The high priest then questioned, or the high priest then questioned uh, Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly in the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews come together and I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand and saying, is this is how you answer the, the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I have said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the priest. And just so you know, for your study later on, if you want to get more into his trial uh, before Pilate, there's a whole lot more of that content here in John than where we're going in Matthew. But let's, let's flip over to Matthew 26. That's really our primary text for today. And so here he is at a second trial, this trial before Caiaphas. And that's where we find ourselves in Matthew 26, verse 57. So he'd been to Annas, and now he moves to Caiaphas. And you got to understand this too. John was written in the, the 80s, maybe 90s. John is written much later. Matthew is the first gospel, written probably in the 50s even, very, very early. And John writes as a supplement. He, he's read, he's very familiar, I'm sure, with the gospel of Matthew. And he's read all that, and he adds these things and that's why it's so helpful that we have the synoptics and we have the gospel of John because they all fit together. And John really jumps in and he fills in some of the gaps that he didn't see and he presents a, a more full picture of the ministry of Jesus. And so that's why we have those two there and we have this one here. Okay, verse, for, verse uh, 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony. Notice they were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man said that he was able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. Let's just hit the pause button on that. Jesus is affirming that he is the Christ, the Son of God, when he says, he says, you have said so. We read in the end of Mark's gospel, he asked the same question. Jesus says, I am. This is who I am. Jesus is the Son of God, this, this God-man. He says, you tell us you tell us if you're really the Christ, the Son of God. Now, now that, that name, the Christ, the Messiah, was loaded with freight. It's the, it's the promise given in the garden in Genesis 3.15, the, the promise of the seed of the woman who's coming. It's the promise we read about in the end of, uh, the end of Genesis, given to Judah, that one of his descendants would have a, the throne would not depart from Judah, the scepter would not depart. It's the promise that we see in 2 Samuel Seven. It's this promise of a king who would rule and reign. And they kind of understood. If you, if you read clearly, they understood that this was a, this was a king to end all kings. I mean, doesn't Isaiah say his, of his kingdom, it will, it will never end? This is a king who would have a rule and reign that would last absolutely forever. So this, this God man, this, this king to end all kings, that's, that's who Jesus regularly claimed to be, the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, tell us plainly, I adjure you by I adjure you, by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a direct quote from Daniel 7, verse 13. And Daniel has this dream, you might remember, of these different beasts coming up out of the river and he sees the, the king, the kingdom to end all kingdoms at the end. And he sees the Son of Man. And Jesus quotes this. And now this Sanhedrin, these 70 guys, these 70 Jewish leaders would have certainly understood that. And they would have known that text. And they rightly understand his claim to be God. They rightly understand his claim to be the God King. 
So don't let anybody ever knock on your door <laughs> and tell you that Jesus didn't claim to be God. He clearly claims to be God. And you can tell this is what he claimed because look at what they want to do to him afterwards. And look what they call it. They call it blasphemy, making himself equal with God. Verse 64 again, Jesus said to them, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven, these clouds of heaven, the, the Shekinah glory clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemies, claiming to be God. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment, he asks. And they answered, he deserves death. And look at the, look at the craziness, verse 67. Then they spit in his face and struck him and slapped him. Uh, skip on down to verse 11 of chapter 27. We read in verse 1 of chapter 27, when morning came, all the chief priests and all the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Okay, so here we are in verse 11 now. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. Again, he's affirming that yes answer. This is who he is. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. We read about more trials to come in the trial before Herod. And we see Jesus was placed. And as you go back and you think about the negatives, let's start with that. What do we see here about Jesus? What do we, what do we learn about Jesus? And what do we learn about ourselves? Let's start with the negatives as we think about this. What do we see in this? We, we see that this was a, a crazy miscarriage of justice. Absolutely was. There was a, a part of an add-on to the law called the Mishnah. And I get this from Alexander McLaren. But we see that the Jews, the people in the Sanhedrin, the leaders of Israel, violated their own laws of justice again and again and again. The first thing that they violate, they violate that this, this trial was not supposed to happen at night. There's no way that a trial was supposed to be held at night. It wasn't supposed to be held during the Passover, during a feast. It certainly wasn't supposed to be held at a private residence. <laughs> That's what you see in Caiaphas's house, miscarriages of justice. Uh, if a witness, you read in, in, the, in the Old Testament, if a witness came and bore false witness, that person was supposed to be stoned. But what they would do is interrogate these witnesses, and then everyone would show that he was lying, and they would just move on to the next one, not even a slap on the, on the wrist. Because Caiaphas, who presided over that second that second trial, Caiaphas wasn't really a judge. He's like a prosecuting attorney. Wasn't that really his goal? His whole goal was to set up a pretense of a trial. This was no trial. They could have just stoned Jesus. They could have just killed him. This was to set up a pretense of a trial and just move it on through. Another part of their justice system that we still have in ours is that a person wasn't supposed to be encouraged to incriminate himself. And that's what Caiaphas does. He says, swear by the living God, tell us who you are. And he moves forward in that. A, a, a crazy miscarriage of justice. This, the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus was the greatest injustice that ever happened to the most holy person ever imaginable. But it was made up of a lot of injustices as we move our way through that. That's what it was. Not only that, but you see the the cruelty, cruelty, Jesus, the only, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and you see him slapped. So, so he's trying to give his testimony, and they come up and just hit him, right? Or, or he, he says who he is, and they start to hit him. You just see the cruelty there. The, you see the fingerprints of Satan all through it, don't you? You see the hatred, the, the, the virulent hatred. You see this all through this. You see what they do, and, and you see that bit of rebellion in ourselves, too, unless we point fingers all the time. That is who you were. Years you spent in vanity and pride, caring not our Lord was crucified. You see that. 
even in ourselves, antagonism against Jesus. We see that in the trial. But you also see the beauty of Jesus here, don't we? The, the amazing character of Jesus. Uh, he had been with them for three and a half years, and he had spoken all day long. Sermons all day long. Never put his foot in his mouth one time. <laughs> uh, we couldn't go 30 minutes without doing that, right? And we see Jesus consistently uh, speaking truth. So much truth. So such radical purity in his life that not one person could come and level any accusation that would stick. And the only accusation they have is his, his, uh, his analogy he uses about himself when he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And that's the only thing they could come up with. Wow, you see the character, the impeccable character of Jesus? You see that here? You see his love for you too, don't you? you see his deep love for you? Jesus, you, you might remember if you... Go back in John's gospel, John 18. They say, who are you seeking? And he says, Jesus of Nazareth. They fall back. Do you remember this? Jesus had tremendous power. And in his meekness, his power under control, he could have called down 10,000 angels. He could have been set free. Imagine how angry you get when somebody comes against you. When any injustice, the slightest, anything smacks of injustice and how angry you get. But we see the, the brilliant control of Jesus absolutely in control, power under control the whole time. He had absolutely every ability to free himself from this miscarriage of justice, and he doesn't do it. And he stays, you see the, the beauty of Jesus, the character of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the control of Jesus. We see these things, and I pray, Christian, that your hearts are drawn to Jesus, your Savior. And you see the dichotomy even between ourselves, and you see the beauty of Jesus. That's the trial that was. Okay, so let's shift gears. Secondly, we want to look to the trial that's coming. So that's the trial that was and the trial that's coming. Back in Matthew uh, 26, verse 64, Jesus makes reference to this trial. It's a veiled reference. There's plenty of other places in Scripture where it's more specific. But we see some reference to this trial that's coming. You remember Caiaphas asks who he is. And Jesus says in verse 64, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's talking about when Jesus comes back, when Jesus sets up his rule and reign that will last forever. And one of the things that we read about in Revelation chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment. If you were with us through our study of Revelation a couple years ago, we went into great detail about that. Jesus is actually the judge. Jesus says in John chapter 5, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. The Father has given all judgment to me. This is all through Scripture. This is who Jesus is. He's going to preside over the great white throne judgment. It's, it's what I mentioned before in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. We're going to need to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's a separate judgment. you got the great white throne judgment for unbelievers and the Bema Seat judgment for believers, it's a, it's a judgment of reward, and that's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But we see laid out perfectly that Jesus is going to be the judge. If you study in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus says everything, or the writer of Hebrews says, everything is laid bare and naked before the one to whom we must all give an account. Jesus, as you read about in Revelation chapter 1, with the eyes piercing like fire, Jesus who sees everything. Jesus will be the judge. So, so let me get this. We had the judge of all the universe on trial in the dock himself. <laughs> just, just imagine that, the humility. Of course, he had to come this way. It's the only way the plan would work, that he would come and live the perfect life that we could never live and die the death that we could never die. It's the only way this could possibly work, that he came in the miracle of the incarnation and humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. I mean, it had to be that way. It's, it's the only way it would have worked. But it, isn't it mind-boggling? Isn't it, isn't it mind-boggling to think about Jesus, the judge, on trial himself? This is biblically illustrated in the life of Joseph. You think about Joseph. You remember him? So he has these crazy dreams, these dreams that actually will come true. He has these dreams. His brothers hate him. They hate him. And he comes to Shechem, and his brothers say, let's kill him. Reuben says, let's not kill him. He is our flesh and blood. 
Let's sell them to these Ishmaelites. And as Joseph is pounding on that pit, I can just imagine, he's pounding on that pit, on the walls of that pit, his brothers stand in council. They, they're the judges over Joseph. And they say, no, we're not going to kill him. We're going to sentence him to a life of imprisonment in Egypt. 20 years go by. You're familiar with the story. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams and by the providence of God, what they meant for evil, God turned out for good. You remember this? And then Joseph presides over the trial of his brothers. Remember this. Things get switched up. Joseph presides over the trial of his brothers and, and uh, they come sniveling in and Joseph is the judge. You think about those things. And you think about the trial that's coming, and let me just tell you, something in your humanity, made in the image of God, loves that story. I remember loving that story of Joseph as a kid. You love it. You're like, yes, things got set right side up, so I'm going to do something weird. Things got set right side up. We can't stand it when injustice is done. It's like that. Try not to scratch up your stage. All right. We can't stand it when injustice is done. It's like something is just wrong. The balances of justice are out of whack. And we crave justice. We crave for things to be put back right up again. We crave that. We long for that. And, and there's something inside of humanity made in the image of God. The animals have no, no concern about justice. There's something about you made in the image of God that craves justice. So we put it into our movies. Roger, we put it into movies like Cinderella. I guess she was oppressed, but things came around in the end. So we put it into, it's, 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 a, it's a theme that's, weaving through, that's woven through all these movies. We, we put it in there. It's something that you crave yourself. I'm not trying to drum up bad memories, but you remember being in middle school? Lincoln, you remember being in middle school and, and you were a late bloomer? Moving along, you're playing football, you're like 90 pounds, and your buddy is like 140 because he went through the change of life a little faster than you. And he beats you up a lot. A year goes by, and you hit it too. Isn't it fun to crush him a little bit, right? Like you bring things back. I, and, and, and there's something inside of us that longs for justice. There's something inside of us that longs for things to be put right. You know, this is true at work. Uh, there was that time where that person who was kind of a jerk and really just put all the work on other people and for some reason... Your boss's boss made a mistake and placed that person in a position of leadership. And that person was a terrible leader, absolutely terrible, was not a servant leader. And eventually that person was fired or something and they moved on. And you were like, whew, I'm glad that six months is over. That was t- the reign of terror. I'm glad, you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm glad that's over with. And there's something inside you says, yeah, it was like this, but I long for it to be set right back again. There's something about that. Now, If you, made in the image of God, long for justice, and in fact, it's probably bugging you. It would bug me, the little OCD in me that this has just been laying here the whole time. Know this. This is coming. This is coming when things are set right, when the real king comes to judge, when Jesus presides over the court and everything is laid bare, and every judgment is put out there. Now, in saying that, some of you are probably smiling and rejoicing and say, yes, and I hope you are Christian, because this world and the injustice done in this world is going to be righted, and and you can rest in that. And let me just say, you don't have to take, you don't have to avenge yourself because of that. Leave room for the wrath of God, right? So so we know that's coming, and I I hope that consoles you, Christian. I hope that calms your fears. I hope it takes, takes the anger out of your hand. But let me ask you, are you ready for that judgment? Are you ready for that judgment? Have you, have you settled out of court? Are, which judgment are you going to stand before? Are you going to stand before the great white throne judgment at the end of the age when the dead, small and great, and the books, the book of life, and the book of works are laid open? Are you going to stand before that? Or are you going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat judgment? Has there been a time where you have settled out of court with Jesus and said, I, I deserve the wrath of God. Jesus, would you please give me your perfect righteousness? I'm, I'm through trusting in my own righteousness. I'm through trying to work my way just to present that I'm righteous before myself, before other people, before you. I am nothing. I'm helpless. Jesus, would you please clothe me in your perfect righteousness? And you put your faith 
And Jesus, has there really been a time where you've settled with the king? You've settled with the judge out of court? I hope so. Christian, let me ask you, are you ready? Are you thinking about the judgment seat of Christ as you look forward to? Because one day it's going to be too late, too, to change some things. And I think, and I know this is going to be the case, at the judgment seat of Christ, and Jesus gives you rewards in the form of probably of crowns. And he says, Tom, this is, this is because you purely loved your family. This is because you purely loved me, because you authentically did this thing out of love for me and love for other people. And it was not mixed motives. You didn't do it for pride. Give you this crown, this crown. And there's going to be something inside of your perfected, glorified body that's going to want to say, okay, now can I please get this crown off my head and lay it at your feet, Jesus? There's going to be something inside of you that just wants to lay every bit of crowns at Jesus' feet and say, oh, Jesus, you're amazing. And you're going to wish, you're always going to wish that you had more. So let me encourage you as you look forward to the judgment seat of Christ. If you are in Christ and you look forward to the judgment seat of Christ, be working the works that will last, the works that won't be burned up like we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 4, or chapter 4. Be working the works that will last. We see the judgment of Jesus that was, the judgment where Jesus presides, that's coming, where things get flipped. And, and then the third thing that we need to look at today, the trial before you today, the trial of Jesus that's before you today, the trial before us right now. And, and let me ask you, are you going to put Jesus through the kangaroo court like they did that day? Like Caiaphas, or who had an idea of who the Messiah should be? Like Caiaphas, are you going to try to, to, to present to your heart a different Jesus than truly exists? Are you thinking that maybe Jesus is a version of a, a person who's just always sweet and just kind of helps you do whatever you want, propels you on to great prosperity, and, and he's all about just giving you perfect health, wealth, and prosperity? Is that, is that your concept of who Jesus is? Do you, do you come looking for a false son of man, a false messiah, is that the kangaroo court you're running today when you think about Jesus? Or are you like the crowd who puts in a substitute for Jesus? Who did they call out for? They called out for Barabbas, right? Are you like the crowd who says, instead of Jesus at the top of my pyramid of affections, I'm going to put this thing. I'm going to put this person. I'm going to put my love for power, my love for control, my love for comfort, I'm going to put that at the top of the pyramid of my affections. And you lapse into idolatry like the crowd. Or are you going to be weak when it comes to thinking about Jesus? Are you going to be like the Sanhedrin? Who, and I'm sure some members of the Sanhedrin knew the truth, but they just go along with it. Are you going to go along when, when Jesus is slandered? Are you going to go along and just keep your mouth shut when you should share the gospel, when you should stand up for the truth? When you, you should speak up against sin. Are you going to be like Pilate, who just washes his hands of it, and says, ah, it's not my problem. What will you do with King Jesus? And that's the question for you today. Well, the obvious thing to do with King Jesus is to make him king of your life. Make him king of your life for the first time, some of you maybe. Make him king of your life that he belongs for the 10,000th time today. So let me speak to you. If you're not sure you've made Jesus the king of your life, make Jesus the king of your life for the first time. <laughs> let me just say to you, how good of a job have you done as king of your own life? I, I think we would all admit we've done a horrible job leading our own lives. Nobody lies to you like you lie to yourself. Uh, nobody beats you up about things you did in your past like you do to yourself. But on the other hand, no one claps for you and, and affirms everything that you do at the same time. You, you are a crazy leader of your own life. Today's the day to put Jesus in control of your life. Make him the king of your life, maybe for the first time. And in fact, this is how the Bible equates salvation. You read this in, in Romans chapter 9, verse 10. Jesus, uh, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Make Jesus the Lord of your life for the first time. And you, my brothers and sisters, make Jesus the Lord of your life again for the 10,000th time. Put him back in the driver's seat of your life. 
Put him back at the top of your pyramid of your affections. Put Jesus back on the top in control where he is. As we look at the trial that was, we look at the trial that's coming and the trial before you today. How will you rule on Jesus? Well, what, what, what will you do with Jesus? And I would encourage you, make him king of your life for the first time or place him back in charge of your life for the 10,000th time as we think about what's coming. If you stand at your feet and as Samantha comes to play, this is a chance for you to just reflect, reflect on Jesus. Jesus, your king. Reflect on Jesus and think through and go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Wouldn't today be a wonderful time to just rededicate your life again? to King Jesus. Put him back in control of your life. Submit to him. And for those of you who aren't sure whether you have a relationship with Jesus, whether you've submitted to him for the first time, just come and talk to me afterwards. I'd love to show you how you can do that. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. would be a great time to confess your willfulness and just submit to him again. God, I pray that you'd work in us. We want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. We want to stare into his blazing glory and be transformed into his image from one degree of glory to the next. We know that starts with submitting to him. We confess, maybe this week, Lord, we confess that we have not sought him the way that we ought. And and part of the reason why we have missed so many things that we should have done to him is we haven't been in your word. And we haven't done what you said because we didn't know what you wanted us to do. Lord, we ask that you would help us to have the discipline that it takes to get into your word early and often. God, we confess that there have been times where we knew what to do and we didn't do it. Or we knew what not to do, and we did it. We confess that to you. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work inside us. Give us the power to will and to work for your good pleasure this week as we submit ourselves to the King, the King who humbled himself, King Jesus, your Son, who humbled himself to be on trial himself, and ultimately will rule and reign forever and ever and preside over the trial of the ages. God, I pray that you would work in us. We ask these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said.